Okay, uh, so for the last talk of the day, we have Monica talking about egg and various versions. Yeah, thanks for everyone being here when it's actually so nice outside. And I was just mentioning that um, I'm really happy I get to talk instead of listening because I'm too tired and listening right now. <laughs> um, I thought just over here I'd give it, just in case you get bored or your mind's wandering and you're lost with the aha gaha stuff, I thought I'd give a little exercise that you can work on <laughs> inside. Uh, so for instance, if we're in S3, we have a nice subgroup generated by the transposition one three, order two, and it's fun to get to any other subgroup of order two in there. Uh, if you're inside of the finite Hecke algebra of H3, you can consider T1, T2, T1, which is the same as T2, T1, T2, which again you can think of as T, S1, S2, S1, or in other words, you could write it as T of 1, 3, that transposition, right? These are all name of the same element. And I claim, if you start with this, you will get the whole Hecke algebra. And so I had mentioned this, that you know, this guy has length three, and uh, you know, three is the biggest length that you can get inside of S3, and you really get everything. So you know, it's not about being conjugate in S3 and getting small subgroups here. When I say the Hecke algebra sees length, this is kind of what I mean by it. What do you mean when you get the whole Hecke algebra? Um, so for instance, if you just take as an alpha, you know, just take everything you can get starting with T1, T2, T1, T1 multiply it by itself one? and add it to things and you'll get all of H3. No, but it's generated by one element. It's an abelic, it's a commutative algebra. Oh. I'm confused about that. Oh, wait. Uh, oh, wait, so what am I? Okay, sorry, I lied you get all of H3. You get a lot of stuff. Wait, Ooh, and then we multiply. Uh, I mean, it's big, but it's big. Not, okay, yeah, it can't be not all of it. It can't be all of H3. What is it that you get? Okay, you get something big. I don't even know what size this is. Okay, you'll get something big. <laughs> you mean the idea, the two sided idea generated by this, or what do you know? No, no, I definitely don't mean that because it's invertible. Um, I will, okay, you'll get something that's definitely bigger than dimension two. Exercise. Work out the answer. Work out the answer. That's the exercise. Sorry. The exercise is work out the answer. That's right. Sorry, it's an exercise. Um, right, like in here, right? If you just take everything generated by one three, you'll just get identity in one three. If you were to take the things just generated by T1, you'll just get the span of, let me write it this way, right? You'll just get the span of 1 and T1. If you take T2, you get the span of 1 and T2. If you take this, you'll get much more than the span of 1 and T1, T2, T1. And you work out what you get. <laughs> it's, it's something. It's something. It's something weird. Okay. Ah. Okay. Back to where we were. So I had left off defining the DAHA, the double alpha Hecke algebra. And just before I remind you of that definition, let's just review our definition for the alpha Hecke algebra. We had two presentations of it. One was given um, analogous to how we define the affine symmetric group. You have your T1 through Tm minus 1, T0 and pi. And of course, if you wanted, you could just take generators T1 and pi to get everything but then I'd have to write down many more relations. And your relations are your usual grade relations, again, taken with subscript mod n, your quadratic relation um, that maybe I should remind you of, my minus t, my t inverse of zero. And I just have to tell you what pi does, and pi moves your subscripts up when you count. And then there was another presentation of the same algebra, which I introduced these x's, so I could call it aha of x or h of x. And the way you go back and forth between not having x's and having x's is that pi is x1, t1, t2, da, 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 t1 minus 1, 
and then you can figure out how to go back and forth between these presentations. And again, my relations were, well, the TIs have the same brain quadratic relations they always do. The axes form a Lorentz polynomial subalgebra. They like meet with each other in the special inverses for themselves. And what you basically need to know is that TI XI TI is XI plus Y. And I should, I guess I could say that um, it commutes with other X's that are far away. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so those are two different. Let's write down the basis here. We could just write T sub W for now, W in the affine symmetrically. Just in the same way for the finite type row, we could do that. T sub W. And I'm taking this convention that, you know, pi for this, you know, I can think of pi as T sub pi if I'm shoving everything into some square. Okay, and then what's your basis here? Well, you have, um, because of the way the relations work, Right, this says you can always move an x to the right of a t. And so the basis here looks like t sub w, say x to the beta, where w now is just in the finite symmetric group, not the affine. And beta is an n. <coughs> aha there, t1, tn minus 1, t0 and pi, and then you throw in Laurent polynomials and I'll call them y's. Okay, and then I have relation. And my relations were, I'm going to cheat for writing my relations. I'm going to write my relations the laziest way possible. And so the laziest way to write my relations are such that you know I get an aha if I take those first two generators but if I take the t1 through tn minus 1 with the y's can you see the green chalk on the board? No. Okay, I'm gonna. The blue is also bad. The lake green is white. Is the lake green more visible? Okay. Peter's running into the more chalk than it is. Okay. Um, so that tells you most of what's going on. And then um, the other, I still have to tell you how pi's and y's interact. And I'll say, well, conjugating by pi should just increment your subscript. Because it did it with the t's, it should do it with the y's. And then you ask, well, what happens when I fall off the edge? And I could write a separate relation for what you what happens when you fall off the edge, but by convention, I can just let y i plus n be q inverse y i, and then I can really think to myself, I have y sub any subscript for any q inverse. And so, for instance, that means that uh, pi yn pi inverse, it wants to be yn plus 1, but I'll write that as y1 q inverse. And likewise, um, pi yn I inverse, it wants to be, um, whoops, that's an N again. Zero. No, 
Well, that's all I need. And yes, I have, yes, I have my T, which is my quadratic parameter, and I have my Q, which is this kind of leaky parameter. It's marked when I kind of wrapped around the Ys by this convention. Um, and what does the basis look like here? Well, you have T sub Ws, Y, Actually, let me write it this way. Y sub alpha is T sub W's, where alpha, actually, let me not use alpha, let me use gamma, sorry, because I like alpha to use. Y is a gamma T W, and the W's in the F isometric group. Um, They're, I mean, they just are keeping track of incredibly different kind of information, right? I mean, T, T is this quadratic parameter just saying, you know, over crossings versus under crossings. And Q is, is about how big your cylinder is in some sense. It's marking, you know, um, it's marking a winding number like a Z mod NZ every time. If, you, if you're lifting Z mod NZ up to Z and you want to know how many times you've wound around, is kind of keeping track of that, so it's a, it's a very different kind of deal. Um, I'll have another way to think about Q in a little bit when I, after I introduce the second presentation. Um, and oh, and then um, I think this came up also. Um, I think Gregor asked me, and I didn't give him the best answer for it, which was um, right. So if the, the finite t's and the y's make an aha. Uh -huh, what does that mean? That means that, okay, I made myself a shortcut and now I'm undoing my shortcut by telling you ti pi, ti is yi plus one. And well, that's also true that then t naught, y naught, t naught should be y naught, y one, but y naught is pyn. And otherwise, t naught can be used as otherwise. So my other presentation well I have my y's, y1 to yn. I have my finite t's, t1 up to tn minus 1, and I have my x. Again, I can try and cheat and say if I take the y's with the t's, that just looks like an aha y. And if I take the t's with the x's, that looks like an aha x. <coughs> okay. I'm not going to tell you the x y relations just yet. Um, I will say that you will get as a basis things of the form y gamma tw x beta. Gamma and beta are in z to the n, so I've got those the wrong monomial. And w is just in the finite symmetric group. Okay, so we see this sort of PBW property, PBW kind of basis, the triangular decomposition. Okay, so you can see why this is an attractive way of thinking about the double affine Hecke algorithm, and it really does feel doubly affine. Actually, and our left outcome relations field, there's two ways in which it feels doubly affine. Right? 
because, oh, if you think of asinizing as throwing in this polynomial sub algebra, we'll just throw them in two of them. The other way in which is double affine is we took an affine Hecke algebra and we affinized it by throwing in a polynomial algebra to your other your first presentation of the affine Hecke algebra. Uh, extended affine. I extend, I'm always doing extended affine. Okay. So, what is the hidden relation that I left out? Well, part of why I left them out is they're kind of messy, they're kind of hard to work with for me. Um, they're hard to remember and get right. And well, they're, they're easy in this other presentation. Okay, but again, but there are advantages to working with the second presentation. Okay, so I'm not going to write down all the relations, but I'm going to write down kind of the minimal relations from which you can figure out all the other relations. Okay. Aha uh -huh, x. Is that with the, the t parameter, the quadratic parameter? And and the little t is always, yeah, my little t is fixed with my quadratic <coughs> parameter for my big t. Okay. So I should have so said, e right? For either of the aha. Uh -huh. For both, yeah, they both, both, both of the ways of presenting it have a q and a t in it, and little t is always my quadratic parameter for my big t. <coughs> <coughs> yes. and so, right, so at the moment, we don't have any relation with the q in there because I haven't given it all the relations. So the Q only comes up when X's and Y's interact. So if I take the product of all the X's, which you'll remember secretly what is that? That's pi to the N in my favorite presentation. And I want to move a YI past it. Well, we know what should happen um, because it's pi to the N. So we'll get Q inverse YI. Right? Because pi's, they keep moving them up, but when you pass between the threshold of n to n plus 1, you pick up that power of q. And you do it, you're doing pi n times, so you have to pass that threshold exactly once. Okay. And actually, from you could deduce this from this relation, but I'm going to write it as a separate relation. If you have the product of all the y's, and you move that past an xi, you would pick up a q. So you would have y1 through yn times xi is q, xi times y1 through yn. <coughs> or if you prefer, you could have put the q inverse on that side and written in the other order, so that x's before y's versus x's after y's picks up the q inverse on the same side. And why should that be true? Well, the product of the y's has, looks like a pi to the n in the aha y, if I wrote the aha y in the other presentation. Okay, generating my relations, this is the one. x1 inverse, y2 inverse, x1, y2 equals t1 squared. Now, you might not believe me that you could figure out from this how x's and y's move past each other, but you can. By basically, you know, you force enough t's in here, you can bump up a y2 to a y3 by putting, you know, t2's on either side of this and t2 inverses on either side of that and moving them around. So from this, you can figure out the commutator of an x1 and a y3 and an x1 and a y4 and so on. And then you're like, what about x1 and y1? That's the nasty relation. I didn't, you'll notice I didn't write down the commutator of x1 and y1, but if you can figure out the commutator of x1 and all the higher y's, and you know x1 with all of the y's, you can figure out the commutator of x1 and y1. But the nice one to write down doesn't follow this pattern of inverse, inverse, not inverse, not inverse, it's mixed, it turns out, for, for the nice relation. Exercise, you can figure that out. Yeah, exercise, figure out that commutator. All right. So, <laughs> um, all right, I, you know, so I was saying in terms of, um, right, I'm happy that I get to speak instead of listening, and then the other thing is if I'm the last talk of the day, I can run like three hours over. <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, okay. <laughs> so let me, um, now that we have the DAHA, so eventually I'm going to go, so we haven't talked about representation theory yet, really. I've just been defining these algebras. And I want to get to the representation theory. But I thought um, to talk about the representation theory of the DAHA, one really wants to jump back to the AHA and use all the tools and tricks we developed here. And, and learn them in an easier setting before you learn them here. And I thought if I spent too much time jumping back to that, we might never learn enough about the DAHA. So let me just say a few more things about the connection between the DAHA and the DAMA polynomials. Because <coughs> that has to do with the birth of the DAHA. Okay, and it's a motivation for studying them. So, okay, I'm going to study your representation. I'm going to take the AHA from the Y's inside, oh yes. So my DAHA, instead of writing DAHA everywhere, let me call it Hold H and T T when I'm just lazy. So hold H N and maybe I'll even forget to put the N on there sometime. So let me induce up a one-dimensional representation of the aha. Now we haven't talked about representation of the aha yet, so let me just say I have a trivial, actually I have a family of trivial representations of the aha. So it's one-dimensional, all of my big T's act by little t, so ti minus t1 is zero, so that's what I mean. So if it was a symmetric group, right, all of your si's would act as one on the trivial representation, so that's the analog of that. And I'm going to just tell you that y1 also acts as one. Well, it has to act by some constant, it's one-dimensional. Actually, it doesn't matter at all what constant I pick, so I might as well pick one. And from that and the relations, you can figure out how all the other y's act. In fact, they'll go as 1 t squared t to the 4 t to the 6 and so on. That's another exercise. OK, and so <coughs> I want you to induce that one-dimensional representation up. And now we have two different ways of thinking of that induced representation. On the one hand, if I want to know, understand it's a vector space, I want to know what the basis of it is. Well, one basis of it is just T sub W's for W in the affine symmetric group. Okay. And that's nice and that's combinatorial. But my other presentation of the aha tells me, well, all right, I tensored over this red aha Y. What I have left are my X's and my X to the beta. Okay. So this, as a vector space, I'll just call it kind of script X. Oh, for my Laurent polynomial. So the algebra is generated by this. Okay, so just as a vector space, they're the same. And so this representation, I'm also going to call it Paul for polynomial, polynomial in X's. Okay. So that's a representation. And um, we'll dig deeper into it later. But what can we say about it for the moment? So um, if I let y, let curvy y be my y Laurent polynomial sitting inside um, the Gaha, this, is, this acts locally finitely. Because we started out with something where all the y's acted by scalars. And then, you know, if you think about it, we just have to move y's past x's, and eventually they can move past and they'll act, and, you know, you'll get, you'll be able to find some minimal polynomial in the y's that'll kill. Um, and I think the x's are Sorry, my friend, mm -hmm. there's something. Yeah. If y1 acts by 1, uh -huh. then doesn't your relation pi yn pi inverse? Say that yn has to act by um, q Ah, so if I am, so to write this, it means I'm in my second presentation where I don't have pi. 
right? And it's saying that y2 has to act by t1, y1, t1. So it'll act as t squared. If you want to know how pi acts, pi is, is it still on the board? It's not. So remember that pi, oh, oh, that's wrong. This x1, t1, up to tn minus 1. So pi acts as a little c to the n minus 1 times x1. It ups your x degree. So that says only y1 minus 1 is still, not yi minus 1. Correct. It oh, says y1 minus 1. Yeah, y1. Okay. 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 Sorry, I misunderstood where your question was. Okay. Um, all right, and for Q and T generic, um, which means basically neither are roots of unity, and I don't have something in the form Q to the A equals T to the B going on. Uh, and we'll see why. I'm hoping in the fourth lecture we'll compute some, you know, get our hands dirty with one of these for a small n, and we'll see where it's coming from. Q and T generic, in fact, um, not only does Y act locally finitely, Y act semi simply. Okay? Um, act semi simply, and I'm going to say with, you know, well, with dimension one eigenspaces, but let's call them weight spaces. So let me say weight space instead of eigenspace. Um, and uh, so we haven't dug in deep enough into the algebra or done the stuff for the aha yet to be able to explain why this happens, but we will eventually. Okay. And, uh, and I should say, we saw in Jose's talk the rational Trednik algebra, a rational aha, and the y's there were very different from the y's here. They were acting real potently. They lowered the degree in the x's, and these y's preserved. So the eigenvalues that they're acting by, right, are, look, are interesting eigenvalues, not just zero. Um, so this was very much not true there. So, all right. Okay, so I have a bunch of weight spaces. That means I can take a basis. Sorry. I can take a basis of weight vectors. That's what this means, right? The polynomial representation for Q to generic, look at the action of Y. It spits out a nice basis. And after I rescale that basis by the appropriate normalization, that spits out what are called non-symmetric abdominal polynomials. So the resulting weight basis, appropriately normalized by whatever the dimension is, gives me <coughs> symmetric okay. um, This also gives me the tools to access the symmetric McDonald polynomials. This is what McDonald originally defined um, and was studying. And so you have to do a bit of work to get there from here if you can. Um, uh, oh, probably I missed this part. Yes. How exactly it looks with weight basis? Ah, so, so you, so the y's are acting semi-simply, right. and so that means diagonalizably, and the weight spaces are one-dimensional. So that means that um, you can find a basis that's a weight basis. Ah, yeah. okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it's nicer than what happens kind of lead theoretically with your carton, right? There you have large dimensions. It'd be like having a minuscule representation. So, so, so the, the I was, so uh -huh. these polynomials are polynomials in the xi's or in, in the xi's? In the xi's. And the and t's. Uh, and q and t. And q and t. Yes. Your, your q and t are in your field. Yes. Yeah. They're kind of. Sure. Just yeah, just yeah, just roughly. Um, so those are not yeah. So let me say a little bit about 
symmetric polynomial. And then people can add sort of. So symmetric McDonald polynomials. Sort of and are they polynomials or Laurent polynomials? Ah, ah, right. So the thing is, yes. You will, of course, get Laurent polynomials because that's what you're starting with. And when people say non symmetric McDonald polynomials, they often only choose the one that are honest polynomials, but you have Laurent polynomials in there as well. By the way that the Ys um, work, you can kind of separate out and live in the total, just the positive degree stuff in the X's. And so you do have. You do very easily show once you get your hands dirty that you can have, if you just look in things of positive degree, you can get a weight basis inside of there. And so if you want to just take honest polynomials, <coughs> so you could say non symmetric McDonald, either you could say non symmetric McDonald the rock polynomials, or you could say, of that weight basis, the ones that are honest polynomials are your non symmetric McDonald polynomials. Mm -hmm. um, so this, you're saying that the product of x1 through xn is in particular a uh, non symmetric McDonald polynomial. Correct. Yeah, correct. 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 Not worry about the wrong. Yes. So let me before. Right. So note by. So by, let's call this star, star one, this guy is one. Right, so by that, give me any weight vector for the y's. If you multiply it by x1 through xn, it's again a weight vector for the y's, where you've just multiplied all the weights by an extra q, an extra q. And so that means that, right, so if, so by, star 1, if f is, uh, let me just say this, is a y weight vector, so is x1 times q, fn times f, and if you multiply by a high enough power, you can clear any denominator you want and make it an honest polynomial from starting from the Laurent polynomial. Thanks, David, that's a great answer. Yeah. yeah. Also, it's the Daha is a squared trader, right? Mm -hmm. And so, in this representation, it's Z trader. Yeah. Yeah. So that means the positive thing is also. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, from the right. And you can see it in these relations as well. Well, no, I think you, well, great. I mean, why is Kim spit out? Is it, is it zero? The zero one is the square trader. Okay. I don't think uh, SL is. Yeah, SL is. Yeah. Um, did that answer the question? Yes. Great. Can I just remark that the coefficients are not polynomials in P and Q? Good remark. They're, they're rational functions. You can't make them. Yeah. Q's and P's are mixed up and they're all over the place. Um, right, so symmetric polynomials, McDonald's polynomials, so what are they? Well, they're a basis of, well, if we take the honest polynomial one, not the Laurent polynomial one, they're a basis of symmetric polynomials in, in the X. Okay. And, well, there's many bases that you know and love, like the Schur basis, monomial basis, and so on. They can be characterized by that, you know, they're triangular with respect to <coughs> the monomial basis. And orthogonal with respect to a particular um, inner product that you put on here, which is a QT deformation of the Hall inner product. So you might know if you study symmetric functions, 
if you take the Hollander product, if you know what that is, um, symmetric polynomial, and you say, I want a basis that's triangular with respect to the monomial basis and orthogonal um, with respect to the Hollander product, you will spit out sure function. Um, and so this is a subject version. And you can also have, you can get like Hall Littlewood polynomial doing this way, except only this sort of T deform, T Q, whatever variable people use. Um, so you get interesting functions, interesting families of orthogonal polynomials that you study for various reasons. And this is one interesting family whose specializations include like every other interesting basis of symmetric functions that like people cared about. In, you know, so many different ways. We set, yeah, you take very, and it's so, the specializations that recover most of the interesting bases. Um, yeah, you want to are there other things I should say about why McDonald's polynomials are interesting or why you don't want to be studying them? Yeah. yeah. So if the sure function is also formed with an orthonormal basis. Yes. Is there like why do we not care in this case that McDonald's polynomials are only formed orthogonal? Oh, orthogonal versus yeah. orthonormal? Yeah. That's a good question. Because yeah, like, um, like, yeah. like other of the basis of the symmetric functions are also orthogonal, but usually like the reason we work towards the sure function is because of that orthonormality. Yeah. So, so, well, if you sometimes you look at bases that you say are orthogonal and normalized such that you know the coefficient of a particular polynomial in there is one. That's another way to specify, right? So, one some some say orthonormal. Some some that just tells you how to rescale things, um, especially if you're having two different families. And but you could normalize by specifying oh the coefficient of a particular monomial, which your favorite number. Um, we didn't, oh, why don't you want to make these orthonormal? It gets I can try to answer that later. There's sort of, um, and I should say for people who are familiar, say, with like Mark Kamen's work with McDonald's polynomials and looking at um, that being the generating function of interesting geometric spaces, those are the modified McDonald polynomials. Um, these are sort of often denoted by P lambdas in the literature as compared to the modified ones that show up more in geometry and um, diagonal harmonics and so on and the n factorial conjecture or n factorial theorem. Uh, and you get from, these are, you know, you, you do some flectism, you modify your inner product, you go through an integral form, uh, there's good reasons, which I would have to like go back and read McDonald and dig up, of like why they were defined this way and normalized but this way. Historically, yeah. one of the triangularities is with respect to monomials, yeah. the unipotent triangular. Ah. It's the top monomial that has coefficient one. Mm -hmm. And that fits as a normalization, and then you can ask what is the inner product? McDonald constant thing. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. So that was what they were striving for, that particular normalization. Um, but yeah, I should say that you know, there's also these integral form J lambdas that you'll see. There's kind of other things that are also labeled McDonald polynomial, but these are sort of the original ones of McDonald's. Yeah. So one thing I missed, so in the spirit of your Gaha, mm -hmm. So how are the non-symmetric <laughs> and the symmetric ones related? Uh, I didn't tell you that yet. I did not tell you that yet. Um, you, I was going to save that sort of for later. Okay. Okay. Um, well, can I, but yeah. Uh, you take yeah. your symmetric functions in the Y. Mm -hmm. They preserve they the symmetric. They act on symmetric functions, and their eigenbase, eigenbase. Okay, I was going to say that later, but we can say it now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me say so. 
So when Q went to your generic, <coughs> this polynomial representation is irreducible. So it's not going to have any proper submodules. But if you look at sim x in there, and you just take the subalgebra of symmetric Laurent polynomials in the y, and so I mean symmetric Laurent polynomials here in the x for instance, and you take symmetric Laurent polynomials in the y's, and um, if you just let that act on the symmetric polynomials in the x's, it's preserved by symmetric polynomials in the y's. Okay. And it turns out that, ah, again, your wave spaces are one dimensional. And when you take your weight basis up to rescaling, normalizing the way that you're choosing to have a particular coefficient being one of a particular monomial, this will become the McDonald polynomial sphere. So the sim y weight basis appropriately normalized are the symmetric McDonald polynomial. And part of how you prove that is by understanding this inner product and slightly tweaking it in the context of this representation and understanding that the y's are like more or less self-adjoint operators, not exactly, but enough so that, so you know, if you have an adjoint operator and you have eigenvectors for it and you have distinct eigenvalues that says the eigenvectors have to be orthogonal. Something like that happens here as well. That the, the way that these y's interact with your inner product forces their weight basis to be orthogonal. And then you have to normalize. And so that's how you split up the McDonald polynomial. And possibly, hopefully, when we get to it, we can actually see why this happened. Or if we run out of time, I'm happy to show you. Um, okay. So, let's start studying some of the representation theory. So one, um, one motivation for studying the representation theory is that we can understand this representation, we can understand non-symmetric or symmetric McDonald polynomials. Um, also, Tina had mentioned that finite dimensional representations are very interesting. Well, the Daha type GLN is not going to have finite dimensional representations. You have to pass the type SLN to do that. But um, those are sort of very interesting and um, they come up in these uh, right torus knot uh, wave homologies. They're, um, they're complex polynomials are very much the label so it's the finite dimensional representation that you see um, for the SLN so again, we would, might like to compute an example or understand that. Uh, but I should say the representation theory of all of the Daha trying to understand, classify, say what's going on is very difficult. We're just going to focus on something that's like a category <coughs> all that's on because they have So right, we said the Ys are going to be acting locally finitely and even better than that. Oh, so I'm just going to restrict myself to the category of representations that are finitely generated and where the Ys act locally finitely like a category of, and even just saying what's going on there is hard enough. Uh, you said that the Daha ne the GL never has finite dimensional representations, but I guess presumably if Q is finite dimensional representations, yeah. if Q and T are special, I mean, oh, even for, if for special values of Q and T, they would, I don't think of a narrow way of doing it. Um, like okay. so you community. can always multiply by pi, and, uh, Okay, yes, for Q and T. Yes, yeah, right, right. good. Katarina, I was Katarina will in. construct sort of a unique, next week we'll construct a unique irreducible representation. And she's GL. Okay. Sorry, 
I was stuck in Q and T being generic. Um, or not me taking the book. All right. So. start understanding the least representation or understand and how do we see that the y weight spaces are all one dimensional or how do you build like what if I, okay it has this y weight basis well build me um, build me some McDonald polynomials and at the moment we've got a whole big family of McDonald polynomials right <laughs> we've got <laughs> powers of x one x two up through xn because they have this nice property of how they move past y so one thing we're going to do is we're going to find these things called intertwiners, other elements in the help algebra that move nicely past y, so they produce new y weight vectors from old y weight vectors. And that's a, um, a very major tool that I use quite a bit. And then the other major tool that I use is, uh, well, actually, yeah, y weight vectors. How is y acting, and how do you move between y weight vectors? That's kind of my favorite tool to use. OK, so. So let's go back to our affine Hecke algebra. Um, say h of x could have taken h of y. Uh, so what am I going to use? I'm going to use that x is this large commutative subalgebra, right? So. You do this with Lie theory all the time with your Kekon subalgebra. So I have this affine Hecke algebra, you know, infinite dimensional, but I've got this large commutative subalgebra that I can act, ask how it acts on representations and access them that way. So that's going to be one of our big tools. And um, let me just say, and I'm just affine, I'm not double affine for the moment. When T is generic, I claim that um, induced modules from one dimensional sort of tell the whole story. Okay, so HJ, remember we had parabolic subalgebras for the symmetric group? We have parabolic subalgebras of our affine Hecke algebra. And in one sense, do they tell the whole story? I mean, you could say, hmm, for the symmetric group, if I just induce up from parabolics the trivial representation, uh, and if you say look in the growth and heat group, they'll span. They'll give you everything you want to know if you go to the growth and heat group. Same thing here. Okay. Um, so, right, so in the growth and heat group, Um, these such modules um, span it, and in fact, you can pick a basis for um, the growth in the group among such things. Okay. Uh, and so, Hj, what is Hj? Uh, if it was the symmetric group, right, we would just take Si for i and j. If we're in the affine Hecke algebra, you do that, but then you also take all of your x's. And the reason that you do that is because then the affine Hecke algebra will be a free right or left hj module of dimension, um, well, exactly the same as what Sn is over Sj. Okay, because you sort of nullified all of your x's. And so, um, right. so just to fill in some of the history, when T is generic, you can describe all of the simple modules for the affine Hecke algebra. And again, you use 
x's and x weight vectors to tell you a lot of the story or x, x characters. And it turns out restricting to x in the growth unit group tells you everything. Right? So if you, I give you a module, let's say a simple module of the affine Hecke algebra, I restrict it to x and I just tell you what do I see, what's its x character, which one dimensional representation do I see with relative multiplicity that's characterized in the growth unit group, what that is. So the characters are really, really independent. <coughs> Um, all right, let's study another kind of representation. Let's induce a trivial representation from HN finite. Oh, yeah. What one is, now that you put the extras in? What is this? I do need to tell you. Um, yes. So I was being sloppy here. I was going to, let me just say, <laughs> one dimensionals on which the TIs that are in there attribute. Yeah, I'm being sloppy with how the X's are acting. Ah, most of that is rubbed. I didn't think it was relevant for everything. Uh, okay. So here I'm, I'm ambiguous. I induce for the finite Hecke algebra to the affine. Well, let's remember what our affine Hecke algebra looks like. Let's take a presentation with t's and x's. Oh, well, all of my t's are acting trivially. My basis looks like monomials and x's and t's. So this, right, looks like the wrong polynomials again. Just like Paul did for um, our Daha. Well, I mean, it's the same underlying vector space, right? The same underlying vector space, but you just don't have the whole Daha acting, you only have the Daha acting. Okay. And so let's study this representation for a little bit, because if one of our goals is to understand it for the Daha. So I claim from the relations that we have, give me any polynomial in the x's, then the following relation holds. Tif minus f acted on by si times ti. So this just means swap all the xi's with all the xi plus one. This is equal to t minus t inverse. These are little t's. f minus f acted on by si divided by 1 minus xi over xi plus 1. Okay, so that follows from how it acts on the single xi. It kind of packages together and you know it's just um, And so what do we get from this? We get two in, well this tells us how t is going <coughs> on the polynomial representation. So is that in the Daha itself? Or we're in the aha now. Uh, yeah, we're just in the aha. So my eyes are finite, right? I is just uh, running from one dimension. Although actually, it would work as just as well with a t zero there, if um, if it was t zero with y's, it would work just as well. <coughs> Same with the s zero action is and so on. Um, so. Right, so this is telling me, and well, let me just, by abuse, call it Paul, right, ti acts on f as fsi just times a little t plus the same thing, t minus t inverse, f minus fsi over one, on one minus fsi, fsi plus one. Okay. And nobody questioned whether this state is, is polynomial, because we've seen things like this before. Clearly, one minus xi over xi plus one divides this. And also notice it preserves degree. I didn't put xi plus 1 minus xi. That's something to be 0 on the bottom. So um, on the one hand, I get that action. Also notice that, I think I'll say two other relevant things that it says up the next time. Let 
me write E plus for my trivial item potent in the finite hex algebra. Um, right, it's the expression in T's that, um, you know, it looks just, it looks a lot like the trivial item potent for the symmetric group. You're pretty much summing over all your T's of W's, but with the appropriate coefficient. Um, so then I claim that if you let E plus act on the polynomial representation, it's just going to spit out symmetric. Honestly, it's honestly. If you move the E plus all the way to the right. Oh, right. Because when does, so, so, Ti minus T, E plus equals zero. It's a trivial item potent. It's what affords the given representation. If you go through this and you say, hmm, when does Ti minus T kill something? It basically forces this f minus f s i to be zero. You have to write it down a little carefully. It forces that zero, and it's true for all i, so it forces it to be symmetric. So that's one interesting upshot, and that goes into um, right when we talked about going between symmetric versus non-symmetric McDonald polynomials. That's part of why this symmetric things and why are preserving symmetric things in X is it's because this trivial item potent is kind of living underneath everything and forcing it to happen. And then the other upshot of that formula is that the center of the affine Hecke algebra is just symmetric polynomials in the X system. One direction is clear. If you take something that's symmetric, then this f minus f si is killed for all si oh, up here, right? And and well, f si is equal to f, and that just says f is equal to all the t's. And polynomials can be a polynomial. You have to do a little bit of work to get the other direction. And oops, one more thing. Corollary if m is a simple affine Hecke algebra module. And this is the only place where I need my field to be kind of big enough, but uh, that I want to be absolutely irreducible. Then the dimension of M is less than or equal to N factorial. Okay. So the affine Hecke algebra is this big infinite dimensional thing, but it really is the size of the symmetric group times something commutative. And that commutative stuff doesn't get in the way. So the biggest dimension that you can get is n factorial. Um, and that's good because um, it's nice that they're finite dimensional. That means that we can find generalized y weight vectors sitting inside there. Notice that Paul is not simple. It's infinite dimensional, right? Try to find a simple sub in it. No, that's like fine. C, C join x and C join x module is not nice to look at, even though it has nice quotients. But give me something simple, it's going to be finite dimensional, and I'm going to have to be able to find weight vectors sitting inside of there. OK, we all want to go home. We're tired. Thank you. here that Arun tried to get me to fill in. Uh, if you basically, these one dimensional representations that you stick in there, the way that the x's act, they basically act kind of according to the contents that you would put in, in the Young diagram, kind of reading row by row. 
if you sort of stuck them in there, that this guy would have a unique simple quotient that would be that inflated guy. Or depending on how you order them, either unique simple sub or unique simple quotient, depending uh, on you order the rows. Yeah. Yeah. And then, oh, and this map here, right? You just send a TI to a TI. And then X1, you can send anywhere you want, any constant, might as well pick one. And that forces what X2 and such goes on. Actually, we'll flesh this out later because this is going to connect to Jesus Murphy elements that came up in his talk. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so I was planning on talking a bit about intertwiners, um, which I mentioned get you from old y weight vectors to new y weight vectors. And um, I was maybe thinking of actually getting our hands dirty with a polynomial representation for n equals two or n equals three, and maybe showing that when I go to SL and pick Q and T not generic, how I can get a final dimensional quotient. I thought that might be good. Oh, and you know, talking about how induction or restriction or adjoint, and that makes life happy. But I'm open to suggestions if people have other things. Yeah, especially if you've looked at the abstract for the upcoming talks on the Daha and been like, oh, I'd really like to know about XLC. Well, we already know what it can Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, let's think on it.